Hey there, hope you're having a wonderful day. So in this video, we're going to go over a new series on my YouTube channel called Object Oriented Programming in C++. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll find a playlist for beginner C++ programming. And here we go over various topics in C++. So we have variables, data types, conditional statements, getting user input, arrays, strings, vectors, for loops and while loops, pointers, references, dynamic memory allocation, functions, enums, error handling, iterators, sets, pairs, maps, tuples, date time, and file handling. So currently there are 58 videos in this beginner C++ tutorial series, and I think this is a good stopping point. I will add more topics in the future, but for now I want to focus on a new tutorial series, which is object-oriented programming. And ideally, you should be familiar with all the concepts in this playlist, before moving on, if you're not familiar with some of these concepts, make sure you check out this playlist. And without further ado, let's go on to object-oriented programming. So what is object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming, or OOP, is a programming paradigm that involves representing abstract and physical objects. And one of those abstractions that we work with is a list. And a list is represented by a vector in C++. So a list you can think of as a piece of paper with a bunch of items listed. So you can remove and add items to the list, which is exactly what a vector does. And we can also use OP for other things such as video games. So in video games, we have characters, items, weapons. These can all be represented. So characters can have a name. Items also have a name. They might have an effect. Weapons also have a name. They might have a attack power or weapon category, etc. And if you ever do online shopping, you can also represent customers. So we have the name, the address of the customer for products. We have the name of the product and the price and the shopping cart. This can be represented as a vector of products. And over here we have shapes. If you work with math, you can have circles, triangles, squares. So you can have the width and height be represented. So object-oriented programming allows us to represent all these abstract and physical objects in code. So for this introduction video, to object-oriented programming, I will mainly focus on the vector since we are familiar with how a vector works. So object-oriented programming involves creating classes and objects. So objects are also referred to as instances of a class. And in C++, there's also another concept called a struct, which is essentially the same as a class, except there's one minor difference, which I will go over in a later video. So a vector is a class, and if I define a vector like so, which is basically std vector, so this is a vector of strings, and I named the variable shopping list, this shopping list is an instance or object of a vector. And how is the vector defined? Well, I can click on this website, or I can just press control and left click on this word vector, and you can see it says class vector. And if I click on this, you can see this vector is a class. And over here, we can see the actual implementation details of the vector. And as I mentioned in my beginner C++ tutorial series, moving forward, we are not going to use namespace std. So for that reason, I've added the qualifiers here. So std colon colon vector and std colon colon string, okay? So a vector is defined as a class and this shopping list variable that we created, this is an instance or object of the vector, okay? Now objects have properties and you'll find that in programming there's a lot of terms and synonyms. So these properties are also referred to as fields, member variables, data members, or attributes. Basically the data members would be either text, numbers, or switches. So these are represented by strings, int, float, or double, or boolean. And data members can actually be other classes, but these are the primitive data types. And so for example, the vector class can have these data members, size, which is an integer, capacity, which is also an integer, and an array. So these are all data members. So the array will be used to hold all the elements together. And you can also keep track of the size of the array. So every time we add and remove elements from the array, we increment or decrement the size. Now objects also have behaviors. 
and these are also referred to as methods or member functions. They are basically functions inside a class. So here you can see we have an object, which is a vector shopping list, and we can do pushback, which will add a value to the end of the vector. So we can do pushback pencil, pushback notebook, and we can also do popback, which removes the last value in the vector, okay? So just to summarize, Classes have properties, which are member variables, and behaviors, which are member functions. So properties refer to the characteristics and data values inside a class, and behaviors refer to the functionalities, okay? Now, object-oriented programming revolves around four concepts or design principles. They are abstraction, encapsulation, polymorphism, and inheritance. So first one is abstraction. So classes and objects they are basically a black box. This means that you know it's a box, but you can't see inside of it. So essentially, implementation detail is not important and can be abstracted away. So for example, the vector is implemented with an array, but a user doesn't really need to know that. Users are instead provided with the methods to add and remove from the array without directly modifying it. So if you remember before, if I hover over this word vector and I press Control and left click, you can see this is the code that implements the vector. But as a user, we don't really need to know about how the vector is exactly implemented. Instead, we just care about what it represents. So a vector is a list. So I can use it for a shopping list and I can add and remove from this list. We are given these functionalities with methods so I can do pushback or popback. And of course, there's also a method to check to see if the list is empty. So there's no need for me as a user to check if the size is zero. Instead, this is all provided to me using methods. Okay, so this is abstraction. Basically, we don't need to know how it's implemented. We just need to know how we can use it. The next concept is encapsulation. So this is structuring the class as a single unit with controlled access. So data hiding and delegation. So as an example, with the vector, we have an array, but users are not allowed to directly access this underlying array and write past the memory. So this is called data hiding. And we also are not allowed to access the size value of a vector. So if I wanted to get the size value, I would have to do so using a method. And this is called delegation, which is redirecting responsibility. So here you can see as an example, let me just uncomment this out. Let's say theoretically, there is a member variable called size. If we were allowed to access this data, we can change it and just set it to 10 like so. But this variable is actually not exposed to us. So I can't do it like this. Instead, I would have to go through a method. And the same would apply if I were to do shopping list dot pushback penso. So this is going to add the string penso at the end of the array, but I'm not allowed to access the array directly. Instead, I use this method. So this is referred to as delegation or redirecting responsibility. It is not my responsibility as a user to look for the end of the array and assign the index value penso. Instead, I just need to call this one method and pass in what I want to add and the vector will handle the rest of it for me, okay? So this is the idea of encapsulation. The next concept we have is polymorphism. Now this word has Greek origin, so poly means many and morph means form. So polymorphism means many forms. And as an example, we can have multiple methods to do the same thing. So here you can see I have my shopping list and I can add a value to the shopping list. So here I can do shopping list dot pushback penso. And now we have one item in the list and we can use the at method and pass in index zero, or we can use the bracket operator to pass in index zero, which will both return penso. So essentially we have multiple ways to do the same thing. So we have many forms. So if I save and run the program, you can see we get penso for both the at method and the bracket operator. Another example of polymorphism is when we are initializing our vector. So here you can see I just create an empty vector, but I can also create a vector with values initialized. So I'm going to comment this out. And over here, I can add a shopping list with three values initialized. So I can pass these three values into the constructor of our vector. So now if I save and run the program, you can see we get notebook, and that is because notebook is the first value in our vector at index zero. Okay, so for polymorphism, you just need to remember many forms, so many ways of doing one thing. 
And finally, we have inheritance, which is the process of creating a new child class, also known as a derived or sub or super class for code reusability. And this child class is going to inherit all the attributes and methods from an existing parent class. So a parent class is referred to as a base or super class. So as an example, let's say I want to create a completely new class called sorted list. And essentially, it does the same thing as a vector except everything we add to the list is automatically sorted. So with a vector, the ordering is maintained by order of insertion. But maybe I want to add values to a vector and I want it to always maintain a sorted order. So instead of by insertion order, I want it to be in alphabetical order. So here you can see if I add pencil, eraser, and notebook, I expect the order to be eraser, notebook, and pencil. Now the vector doesn't support this feature, so what I can do is I can create a new class called sorted list, which inherits from the vector, and I can create a new method called pushback sort. So it's just going to take the value and push it back. So this pushback comes from the vector, and we can just call sort on it. So over here, I'm just taking an existing class, which is the vector, and I'm inheriting from it and adding more features to it. So here I have a sorted list and I add three values and I iterate over the list and print the values. So let's save and run the program. And you can see the ordering is eraser, notebook, and pencil, okay? So every time we add a new value to the list, it's going to automatically sort the list in alphabetical order. All right, so that's the general overview of object-oriented programming or OOP. We talked about classes, member variables and member functions, which are also referred to as data members and methods. And we talked about the four pillars of object-oriented programming, which is abstraction, encapsulation, polymorphism, and inheritance. So throughout the rest of the tutorial series, we're going to expand upon each pillar of object-oriented programming, and we're going to design classes. And by the end of the series, you should be very comfortable in using OOP in your projects. Okay, so that's it for this video. Hopefully you found this video helpful. And if you did, make sure you give this video a like. If you have any questions, let me know down below in the comments. And if you want to stay up to date for more C++ tutorials like this one, make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.